Okay. The time is now 6.05. It is Monday, July 6, 2020. We have a regular board meeting of the Board of Trustees of Goose Creek CISD being held by video conference uh, due to health and safety concerns related to the COVID-19 coronavirus. This meeting will be conducted by video conference or telephone call. On March 16th, Governor Greg Abbott granted a request by Attorney General Ken Paxton to temporarily suspend a limited number of open meetings laws to the extent necessary to allow telephonic or video conference meetings in response to the coronavirus. For more information about the suspension, see the TASB Legal Services article, Texas Governor Suspends Certain Provisions of Open Meetings Act Due to Coronavirus COVID-19. In accordance with those suspended rules, we certify the following. Notice of this meeting has been posted online for at least 72 hours. Although members of the board are not gathered in a central physical location, we do have a quorum, do we not, Mr. Assistant Secretary? We do. And the meeting was properly posted? It was. Okay, we are meeting by use of the Cisco WebEx software application, which allows two-way communication for members of the public. As we would at any in-person meeting, the members of the public who have followed the instructions on the meeting notice for registering to speak during the public comment portion will be unmuted for three minutes to speak. If the speaker submitted written comments in advance, the board secretary, uh, in this case today, would be the board's assistant secretary, will read the comments into record before or during the board's consideration of that item. If you would like to provide comment at a future meeting conducted by video conference or telephone, please follow instruction, instructions on the meeting notice. All other meeting procedures will adhere to board adopted procedures to the extent practicable. An audio recording of this meeting is being made and will be available to the public at a later date. This software application allows for 1,000 people to view and interact at a time. We apologize in advance for any unforeseeable difficulties and ask for your patience as we navigate. Other questions or conditions. If you have questions about this, this is what? Oh, do I keep going out? I'm not touching anything. Okay. Okay, so if you have questions about these suspended laws, please call the Office of the Attorney General at 888-672-6787 or by email at toma at oag.texas.gov. I can hear my echo, so I don't know if y'all hear me or not. We do. <laughs> okay. Okay, so <clears throat> we have called to order this meeting and declared a quorum. So I will now turn it over. We have opening exercises. Uh, number one on our agenda says board members. Okay, so at this time, um, our opening exercises, we should, um, do we have someone? Can you hear me? Are we doing it with this one? Yeah, we bypassed it before. Can I make a motion yeah. we dispense with opening exercises? We have a motion on the floor to dispense with opening exercises. Do I have a second? I'll second. I have a second from Mr. Cotter. Um, all in favor of dispensing with opening exercises due to the current WebEx situation, please raise your right hand or say aye. Aye. All in favor, any opposed, no abstentions, motion carries. We will move now to agenda item number three, which is citizens participation. I believe, Ms. Garcia, we have some um, citizens participation. Do we have any, we, do we have any online to speak? Okay, so let's start with those. Um, Matt, I'll put you in charge of leading them in the first person that i'm going to try to unmute is robin galvan so i'll turn it over to the board secretary to give them the instructions on their um, time requirements okay and mr ricky clem board uh, assistant secretary will be timekeeping for uh, the speakers and again you will be unmuted for three minutes to speak please do not mention any names of 
staff or students or board members in your speech? And Mr. A one minute, yeah, Mr. Clem will give you a one minute warning when your time is uh, about to end. So do we have Ms. Galvan? Ms. Galvan, you're unmuted. I am here and I'll be honest with you. I think I must have done something incorrectly because I really didn't have any comments this evening other than just curiosity. And I just am tuning in to uh, find out what some decisions might be to help me move forward because I am a district employee. So thank you. I'm sure y'all will all make great decisions, but I don't have any any particular comments. Okay, Mr. Flood, uh, thank you, Ms. Galvan. Mr. Flood, would you like to go to the next speaker? I'm going to try to find them one second. Okay. Uh, we do have some comments that were submitted by email that we will read into the record uh, as soon as we have dispensed with the live comments. Samantha Kibito, I think this may be you. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Is, is this Ms. Kibito? Yes. Can, can y'all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. I've, I haven't done WebEx before, so. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, tune in and see, you know, what was going to be going on with the school year. Um, I am personally all for sending my children back to school. Um, they just really need an in-school setting, and I'm just really hoping for that right now. So that was basically what I wanted to say. I have emailed my district board member and she's aware also, so. Thank you, Ms. Kibido, for your comments. I'm Thank sorry. You. I didn't get her last name. Kibido, could you spell that for us, Ms. Kibido? K-I-B-O-D-E-A-U-X. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. All right. The next person I'm looking for is Jennifer Paulus Ashworth. Just a Jennifer. <laughs> Unmute and see if that's you. Jennifer. Hi there. I'm here. Um, I also submitted my comments via email. So if y'all are going to read them later, I can waive my right to comment now. I do okay. not have your written comments. From okay. Ms. Ashworth. No. Okay. Let okay. Me read it's just word for word from the email I sent to Ms. Garcia this afternoon, but I just said, I'm curious what options teachers will have if they choose to stay home. If teachers deem it is unsafe for them to be in the classroom, can they continue to work synchronously from home? I work with teenagers and I do not believe it is safe yet to return to the classroom and I want to make the best decision for my health and the health of my family. So that was my comment and I'm sure they will address that later. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Thank Ashworth. You. Okay, Mr. Flood. Then I have a Yadira Hernandez. Um, right. And she was going to call in, but I have multiple called in users, so and I can. I have about eight call in users. I'm going to have to unmute them all to be able to figure out who. Is that okay? Okay. And what was the name? Who are we looking for? Y Yadira Hernandez. I may be Yadira saying. Hernandez, if you will speak up when Mr. Flood unmutes. Yeah. All right. All called in users should be unmuted now. So. Ms. Hernandez, are you on the call? Ms. Hernandez, can you speak up? And we are not hearing you, Ms. Hernandez, if you're speaking. 
you may need to retry calling in or connecting with the computer and we, if I can see her name then I can uh, try okay. to see her later okay can let's move on maybe to the next did you have one more I had one more or Orlando Laura but I think they may have sent a letter yeah I have a letter Okay, Ms. Hernandez, if you can hear us, um, if you can email or log in with a computer where we can see your name, we would be able to unmute you and, and come back to you. Uh, right now, we'll defer to Assistant Secretary, Mr. Richard Clem, who will read into the minutes um, public speaking that was submitted via email. Okay, I have a letter from Orlando Lara, dated Monday, July 6, 2020. Members of the Goose Creek Consolidated ISD Board. I write as a former Mexican American <laughs> Studies faculty member of Lee College, serving in this capacity from 2014 to 2017, and as a current member of the Ethnic Studies Network of Texas, a network dedicated to advancing ethnic studies and racial equity at the high school level throughout Texas. I am currently a graduate student pursuing a PhD in anthropology at UC Irvine and prior to that served as associate director of the comparative race and ethnic uh, studies department at TCU. As a member and lead facilitator for the Ethics Studies Network of Texas, I work with districts to create innovative courses in ethnic studies and to produce online ethnic studies educator support web series. In short, I am familiar with the difficult work that school districts have before them, addressing long legacies of curricular erasure of in-depth histories of people of color in the U.S., while often promoting disciplinary and tracking practices that produce very divergent outcomes for students of color. It is my opinion that eliminating school names and symbols that honor soldiers and leaders of the Confederate revolt against the United States government to preserve the state right to allow slavery is one very small step that can be taken to eliminate unnecessary cultural and symbolic violence against students at Goose Creek Consolidated ISD. Regardless of where some of these figures ultimately landed in their political ideologies, the fact that they ever fought on the side of preserving slavery and refusing the political rights of black people and other ethnic minorities is enough reason to name local schools after historical figures who demonstrated a lifelong commitment to racial justice and equality. I hope you will consider renaming Robert E. Lee High School to Carver High School, one of the schools that helped to integrate Robert E. Lee and to begin the process to identify an alternative name for Ross S. Sterling High School. Ross S. Sterling, as founder and leader of the Humble Oil Company, allowed white supremacist recruiting on company grounds and even showed up on a list of KKK members in the Houston Chronicle article in January of 1923. Instead of honoring these figures, these high schools should integrate and fully support the newly approved statewide African American and Mexican American studies course. Thank you for your attention. Orlando Lara, grad student, UC Irvine, Ethnic Studies Network of Texas. The other letter I have is uh, from, let's see, on Elizabeth Al Omari. Dear G, she's Dear GCC ISD board members, my name is Elizabeth Al Omari and I am both a parent and a teacher in the district and have concerns regarding the proposed plan to start the new school year. As a parent, I have concerns about the junior high plan. Number one, the plan does not allow for enough time to transitions group A and B with no contact. Two, I am concerned that there is not enough time to sanitize the restrooms and classrooms between the morning and afternoon groups. Three. Number three, students will be required to have a one-to-one -one ratio of electronics to complete their electives virtually, but is that possible? Number four, synchronous online learning will be difficult as a working parent to monitor that my child is awake, logged, and participating. If asynchronous learning was offered, I can monitor them in the evening when I'm home from work. As a teacher, I am numerous concerns regarding the schedule. 
Uh, I, number one, I am concerned the high school plan also does not allow time to sanitize between each period and between the transition between the morning and afternoon groups. Number two, synchronous online learning will can't Sorry, that's what it says. Synchronous online learning will can be an obstacle for students who have multiple children at home and are not all able to log in and attend class if the times overlap. This will cause the students to miss out on the instruction and cause the district to lose funding for attendance. In addition, as a teacher, I'm concerned how I can equally give all my students the amount of attention they deserve if I am teaching face-to-face -face and holding a virtual class at the same time. Number three, the current schedule has high school hours at eight and a half hour days, and that does not include the early arrival or late time teachers are normally uh, contracted to stay. Will teachers receive additional compensation? Number four, Fridays under the current plan are for electives to be face-to-face, -face, so what will the core teachers do on Fridays? During the week, what will elective teachers be doing? Teachers like myself that teach multiple subject subjects, including core and electives, will have many challenges with this schedule. Number four, if more, uh, if more students attend face-to-face -face or transition from virtual to face-to-face -face after school begins, the 15 to 1 ratio will not be possible under the current plan. My suggestion would be to create a schedule that has Group A attend school on Monday and Wednesday, and Group B will attend Tuesday and Thursday with rotating Fridays. This would eliminate the time gap in each day to transition students, reduce the sanitation needed to allow more time for instruction. Uh, also, I believe all virtual learning should occur asynchronous to allow for flexibility in the family schedules, limits on technology they may have, and it will uh, allow for maximum funding for the district. Thank you in advance for taking the time to listen to my concerns. Sincerely, Elizabeth Al Omari. That's all I have. Okay, so uh, Matt, do you think Ms. Hernandez, did, was she able to log in or come back online for her comment? No? No, ma'am. Okay. Okay, so that concludes our section for citizens' participation. We will move on to agenda item number four, which is the approval of minutes. We have minutes from June 15th, regular board meeting, June 17th, board workshop, and June 29th, special board meeting. Uh, we can take them all together or individually. Do I have a motion for minute approval? I would move that we approve June 15, 17, and 29 minutes. I move to a second. I have a motion from Mr. Clem and a second from Mr. Cotter to approve the minutes from June 15th, June 17th, and June 29th board meetings. Uh, all members um, in favor of such a motion, please raise your right hand or say aye. Aye. We have seven four. There are none against and zero abstaining. Motion passes to approve minutes. Now we will move on to agenda item number five, which is discussion items. A, superintendent's reports. I turn it over to you, Dr. O'Brien. Yes, President Woods, we have a few presentations this evening. Our first presentation will be from Dr. Price and Chief Alfaro regarding school safety and security team and the committee um, and emergency operating procedures. Dr. Price, I'll turn it over to you. You may need to unmute, Dr. Price. Mm -hmm. 
Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. All right. Good evening, President Woods, board members, Superintendent O'Brien. Um, I am Dr. Price and I have with me Chief Alfaro. What we're going to do tonight is we're going to present to you our school safety and security team committee final meeting that we had to update the board on what we covered uh, all year long uh, with our school safety and security team committee. The charge of our committee was to ensure the safety of all students, faculty, staff at GCCISD. Our committee members were either a part of our committee safe and secure school team members or they were recommended uh, from the community. Our committee met um, every three months. Our first meeting was August 29th, November 7th, February the 6th, and May the 7th. Our May 7th meeting was postponed due to uh, the COVID uh, pandemic outbreak. You, you may be muted. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening, President Woods, members of the board, Dr. O'Brien. Um, during our August 29th meeting, uh, Dr. Price, Dr. Remenick, Mr. Rasmussen and myself, uh, we each had an opportunity to speak in, about our duties and our roles and responsibilities within the district uh, as to uh, the goal, which is keeping our, our students and staff safe. Um, we also discussed, Mr. Rasmussen also discussed the standard response protocol of the district. Myself and Dr. Price follow up and explain it a little further. And we asked the committee for recommendations on how can we improve our day-to-day -day, uh, safety operations. On our November 7th meeting, we uh, had topics such as uh, Stop the Bleed kits, AEDs and CPR presentations by Nurse Pena. Um, we also had a bullying presentation by Director Dela Cruz of Student Services. And we also continue to collect recommendations on how we can be become better and safer as a district. During our February 6th meeting, um, the committee was given a quiz on our standard response protocol uh, during this meeting, we went over that, the answer to the quiz, and just, again, explain a little bit further in detail our, our, our protocols. Um, the topics of that night were social emotional learning and mental health. Dr. Remenick and Ms. Caldwell were both presenting on that subject. And we went over the recommendations that the committee had recommended in the past meetings. And on our May 7th meeting, which was postponed to May 28th, which was our final meeting, we talked about COVID-19, a new threat, recovering, returning to school. Now, reminding that this was after spring break, so the recovery and return to school was for the end of the year or for our summer school. Um, right now, we are preparing for our fall, but this was uh, at that time. We also had Dr. Romanik who uh, made a presentation on engaging parents, family, and the community. It was basically on communication and getting the feeling and the pulse of the community to see how everyone was feeling about everything that was going on. So we jump into COVID-19 now. Please understand that these, uh, these numbers are, have not been updated since that meeting. We know that the numbers for COVID has gone up across the uh, state, across the district, and across the nation. Uh, but these were the numbers we looked at at that time. During that meeting, we also discussed the role of the police security department in assisting the district once uh, on campus classes were canceled. Um, first step we took was we quickly uh, equipped our personnel, all our officers with proper personal protection equipment. Um, we coordinated with our neighboring agencies, law enforcement agencies to assist in any way possible. Mainly we focused on just reaching out to them as our officers are trained in dealing with our youth. Um, one of the biggest things that we um, 
ask our officers and we train our officers in is building relationships in those campuses with, with our students. Um, during the course of the school year, that's one of their main focus, building the relationships between the police and the students. So now that classes were canceled, a lot of students, a lot of juveniles were out on the street. So we assisted our neighboring agencies with handling some of those juveniles. Maybe we knew them, we knew how to get to them a lot better than they did. Um, we implemented 24-hour police service across the district. Um, the goal there was to um, protect our facilities against vandalism and theft. We also assisted with Harris County Health Department with the Starworth Testing Center and served as a liaison for the district uh, with the Harris County Sheriff's Office, who was the main law enforcement agency running that, that center. And we just assisted the district with multiple different assignments um, providing traffic control, security service to, to make sure that the proper learning equipment was handed out and the meals were distributed to our students and staff. Okay. Okay. Goose Creek, is lo along with all other districts across the state, did an outstanding job at that time, uh, feeding our students, uh, educating them as best we could with the pandemic at hand. Um, you've heard countless stories of outstanding teachers, um, food service employees, custodians going above and beyond uh, to make sure that our students, faculty, and uh, students were safe. This is the spirit of our Texas educators. This was, is what makes us Texans. It's, it's what allows us to grow giants here at GCCISD. During this same time, there were six essential uh, return to workplace readiness items that was set up across the nation and across the state. Those six things were preparing the buildings, making sure that they're clean and checking HVAC systems, preparing the workplace uh, policies, setting up what we're going to do, making sure that we have the distance, learn, uh, the, uh, social distancing and hand washing, uh, control access protocols, uh, making sure we are seeing who's coming in and out of the building, shipping and receiving. Um, create a social distancing plan, reduce touch points, in, uh, increase our cleaning methods and protocols, and then finally communicate for conven uh, for confidence. Now, one thing that we did at GCCIC, we've done an outstanding job with our communications department, communicating and being transparent with the whole COVID uh, pandemic. So we've done a great job there. The next thing we did at, during the recovery and returning to school was we set up a screening program for all employees uh, and visitors, people coming into our facilities. They had to make sure that they were screening themselves or being screened. Um, we asked if there were worsening coughs or symptoms of sore throats, shortness of breath, dizziness, chills, any of the COVID symptoms that are listed there. So we uh, put signs up at the entrances of all facilities to make sure that we, uh, they were screening themselves and being screened. <clears throat> now, mind you, this was uh, a little while back. Since then, our protocols have changed some, but at that time, we were asking for at least three days, uh, 72 hours have passed since the recovery before they can uh, return back to work or come back to a building, and then at least seven days passed since any symptoms or if they had visited their medical provider uh, physician and got a uh, negative test or clear to return to work. Again, all schools were being cleaned and sanitized uh, and disinfected. And then at this point is where Dr. Romanik stepped in and she talked about engaging the parents, family, and the community. And it was basically, as I said earlier, just communication, seeing how everyone is feeling about everything uh, to relieve some of the pressures and uh, seeing how people were feeling about the whole pandemic uh, that was going on. Next, we talked about our 2019-2021 School Safety and Security Grant. We applied for that grant last year and we were awarded that grant in the amount of $385,706. That, those uh, grant funds were, will be assigned to campus active shooter alarms for our, five of our elementary campuses. Um, we'll also use some of the some of that fund for bullet resistant glass or film to be placed in our vegetables and also uh, door locking systems across the district. And then finally, we thank the committee and our team for a wonderful uh, year and all the work and time that they had put in. 
Um, and we'd also like to thank the board for all of the support that you have uh, given the safety and security teams. And we want to thank you, Dr. Price and Chief Alfaro. Uh, we know that this committee was formed by uh, legal requirement of Senate Bill 11, mm -hmm. but you've taken it by the horns and we appreciate you um, getting our um, stakeholder buy-in and uh, opening up and letting them know what our current uh, safety measures are and asking for input on how we can improve our safety measures. So thank you for leading up this committee. We certainly appreciate you and your team. Quite welcome. Uh, any board members may have any questions at this time before we move on? I got a quick question. Um, have we entertained with the with Harris County about some of these areas where some of the people who can't get to these testing station are doing mobile testing in some of these smaller neighborhoods? Uh, no, sir. We no, sir. We have it not at this time. Uh, the last we had with the last contact we have at Harris County was when uh, they had our site set up over at Stallworth and then they moved away to Pasadena. But we have not heard anything about mobile testing sites. One of the things, Mr. Sampson, they've recommended is that families go through their primary care physicians to do the testing at this point. Uh, that can actually be more expeditious than going and standing in line for half a day and getting results a week later. If you go to your pr primary care physician, my understanding is you can get your results back within a day or two. What if uh, some of these people don't have a primary care or don't have insurance, period? They are uh, dependent upon the testing site locations that still exist. As you know, the one at Stalwart Stadium closed down um, a few weeks back. Right. Uh, but there are other locations around the east side of Houston. Okay. Can we, as just because we are dealing with the children, is there any way we can maybe look at doing that, at least through our, our Harris County Clinic we work in conjunction with or any other organization where we can send some of our parents that don't have the resources? I do know that um, our director of benefits, Stephanie Meyer, is working with our local hospitals, all of them, uh, to identify and determine the, the primary thing at this point, uh, what we've identified is it takes too long to get test results back. So she's working on that. My understanding there's progress going on with that, but I know that she's also looking at sites that will be available to our citizens as well. So we'll report back to you when we have more information. I've got some questions. Um, not about the uh, COVID plans. I think those were great. I, but the uh, EOP, that uh, the emergency operations plan. Um, just my questions may uh, sound a little bit weird, but uh, this is the first time I've seen a document like this, so please bear with me. Uh, on page 38 of the document, there's a, a statement that says, uh, during a lockdown order, uh, codes will never be used, that lockdowns will be given in clear, concise messages. And it, and it gives a few examples of some messages. I'm, I'm just curious why codes aren't used. I know that we've had some situations in the past that student the student body and the teachers were extremely alarmed uh because they just copy where it says you know they just come over the loudspeaker they say there's a lockdown situation and no other information is given and you've got students that are terrified and teachers that are telling the students you know we're going to fight for our lives and blah 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 and and it wasn't a lockdown situation that would have ever warranted anything like that are there ways that we can diffuse those situations up front well, due to the recent, in the past, before COVID, COVID, when we had all the uh, active shooter drills going on, there was a movement to remove the codes. Because right. if we have a substitute <clears throat> or someone who was not aware of what code was being called, then they wouldn't know what to do. So it was identified to use the SOP, uh, which is a standard uh, operation protocol, which uses clear language, either say lockdown, and everyone should know what the lockdown means or lockout. So that's why we got away from the codes. Okay. So um, follow-up question on page 39, it says that uh, one of the procedures is that to ensure that all cell phones are turned off. How do we ensure that? 
that's just a, a strong recommendation. We can we cannot ensure that because let's face it, kids are going to call mom or dad if they're scared, and, or post uh, it all over Facebook. That, that that's my concern as a parent. There have been times where I find out what's going on from my kid or from social media before I ever find out from the school district. Yeah. And how do we combat that? The rec well, that's something that if we can build that master up, the world will be the path to the door. But on that, if, if the kids get on the phone in, in an emergency, it ties up the lines. So Chief Alfaro, myself, or Baytown PD or any of the Homeland Security people, we can't get in because the lines are all tied up. That's why it was strongly recommended that we put that verbiage in there. Can we the set up, phone. I mean, I know when in some situations there are schools and, and other campuses, uh, college campuses, for instance, that have these emergency ways to text uh, parents uh, or to put something on Twitter or something on Facebook to alert the parents of the, the situation. Is there any way we can employ some of those measures so that parents can hear directly from us instead of through social media or other students? Yes, sir. We, we do have some of those measures in place. Uh, this is just some of the things that we don't put out in the public. So uh, in particular, communications isn't here to speak tonight, but we do actually follow the incident up. It's just there is a lag for the very purpose of letting police uh, uh, Great. enforcement come onto the campus, make their assessment before any information is given out. But okay. there is a lag in that time. And, and, and last on page 39, this is my last question, I promise. Um, the, uh, again, on page 39, it says, uh, one of the other procedures is to ignore fire alarm activations. The school will not be evacuated using this method. What happens if there is a fire? That that's a very very good question. Uh, that's only if there's a lockdown in place. If a lockdown has been called, a lot of times in the past, some of the active shooters would the intruders would pull the lock, would pull the fire alarm to get the kids out so they could have more targets. Right. So that, but what that, in the lockdown situation, somebody sets fire to something. That's one of those situations we're going to have to handle case by case. It's a tough. We situation. don't have a plan for it. We do have a plan. If, okay. if the, when the uh, respond, the first responders get there, then they will take control of the scene. And if there's a fire in place, then at that point, the police department will be escorting the kids out that are closer to the fire. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. There are a lot of things that we do have in our place that, that we don't uh, put out in the public be for uh, reasons uh, of safety. Okay. Um, I have a question to follow up with Mr. Carter had, had asked. I, I know that a year or two ago I asked about if we were looking into what um, to Alice, and Alice has been really effective, especially when I think of Lee High School and, and Sterling that are so, they're, they're just everywhere. The, there's not a, not like Bruce Creek Memorial, which is more in one building. And I, I, we looked at that as, as possibly uh, training our kids and our uh, first responders on, on that practice? Yes, sir. That uh, Our police department has been trained in, with the Alice, and we do have some uh, personnel trained across the district. Uh, unfortunately, that training has not gone out to our students as a uh, general training, but it's something that we do need to do. Any other questions? Okay. Was, uh, thank you for that presentation, Dr. Price. That was good. And Dr. O'Brien? All right. We, we do can... have another superintendent's report this evening. Uh, it will be the GCCSD Safe Return to School Plan being presented by Dr. Duarte and Dr. Price and the um, some <laughs> other members of the executive team. What I wanted to um, make okay this, a note sorry. of. Is this live? Yeah. Well, uh, getting a little bit of feedback here. Uh, what I wanted to uh, make sure to do before we started even with the presentation was um, basically to let the community know that uh, we recognize that there's many, many, many different uh, options as to what we could or even what uh, in some terms should do. What we've done is we've investigated as much as we can um, across our region, across the nation even, um, and we've taken uh, input from citizens, uh, other stakeholders uh, in our community, as well as our teachers, 
uh, and we, uh, the committees have met multiple times to come up with various options. So the reason we're presenting tonight is because we could sit back and wait and wait and wait and not have a plan, but we are presenting a plan tonight that will allow us to um, move forward uh, with the opening of the school. Uh, and we know, uh, and I just wanted to preclude the presentation, uh, that there may be changes and edits to this between now and the first day of school. So uh, with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Duarte and allow her to explain a little bit more about the process, how we got to this plan uh, this evening, and uh, then open it up. All right, can you hear me? Awesome, and you can see my screen. We are two for two, okay. So we are going to talk to the board about our recommendations for our safe return to school plan. And we started off with um, some small groups really brainstorming all of the possibilities of what school could look like at the beginning of the 2021 school year. And we probably came up with 30 to 40 recommendations on what it could look like. We then narrowed that down, looking at our district data and the statistics that we received from the end of the 2019-2020 school year. And we brought that information to a task force on June 24th of 2020. Just to kind of give you an idea, this shows you um, the task force members that we had participating in that conversation. When we met, there were a lot of components that we needed to take into consideration before we begin the start of the school year. We needed to take inventory. We needed look, to look at the instructional models. We needed to have conversations around what's going on across the nation. So when we talk about social injustice or trauma, we also needed to make sure that we were addressing social and emotional wellness of our students and our staff. Transportation is going to be a big issue for us as well as safety and security. We discussed technology, operational services, and nutrition services. So we took all of these areas and had conversations about how are we supporting our community through instructing our students. So when we talked about taking inventory, we've talked to our principals about being prepared to be aware of what our student population may look like at the beginning of the school year, how many parents are going to opt for virtual instruction, how many students potentially would be looking at face-to-face -face instruction. We also need to talk about our own school staff who are able to return to the district and to the schools for the school year who have underlying conditions and have a concern and need to stay home. So we have to have that information to make some informed decisions. Additionally, we needed our principals to look at their buildings. What space can we use to instruct students? What areas could we convert into classrooms? And how do we maintain some sense of social distancing to ensure the safety of our students? We also had the conversations at the district level. One of the pieces of information that we felt was really important for us to consider is what they're talking about um, in regards to the COVID-19 slide. Now we know when our students return to school after the summer, we see some regression instructionally. When we look at shutting down the school year in March, finishing nine weeks of instruction remotely, having that summer gap, and then trying to start a somewhat normal school year, we will see larger declines in the instructional attainment of our students. And on this slide, what you're going to find is we have greater losses at the primary or lower elementary grades than we do at those secondary grades, yet we still see that regression. Then we look at our reading and we see the same patterns, not as large as the math. And this really sums up what we're talking about. With our COVID slide, what it is suggesting is that when our students return in the fall of 2020, 
they will have roughly 70% of the learning gains in reading. So we will be behind by about 30% instructionally and 50% in the area of math. So not only do we need to work with our students to recoup what they've lost from the previous school year, but we then have a whole upcoming school year's curriculum and instruction that we need to provide for our students. When the committees met, they talked a lot about what are some of the critical concerns that we need to work around when we talk about our plan to return to school. We know that we're going to have the COVID learning gaps. We know that we have students who already had some pre-existing learning gaps. We may have teachers or counselors or administrators who are not able to return to the school year. We are going to have parents that would be reluctant to send their students to school. And what would child care look like if we start to look at some of those hybrid levels of instruction? My child may come to school, my child may not come to school this day. We also need to be concerned about child care for our teachers. If their child is on an off day and they're instructing on that day, what are we going to do with their children? And we really have to focus on early literacy. What's going on with those primary grades is we are teaching these little ones how to read. And the less time we have working with our students, the more challenging it is to decrease those gaps. And then there are so many beginning programs that we work with. You have students that are just learning how to play instruments. You have students that are just learning um, a sport that they're participating in. So when we started the work, and this was conversations started happening in end of May, beginning of June, we talked about if all students could return and we were able to be at 100% building capacity, all the way down to when we first got out of the school year and we started looking at summer school and we were at a 10 to one student to teacher ratio within a classroom. So we wanted to kind of have conversations that revolved around those instructional buckets. So what we wanted to share with the board today is we believe there are going to be three ways to start school. We could start schools with every single child receiving their instruction virtually. Maybe that we have teachers in their classrooms with no children. That is definitely social distancing and students would all be virtual at that time. We could have all students return to school face to face. Things go much better and we're back to 100% and we're prepared with master schedules for that. And we may need to look at and adopt a hybrid instructional plan. So our team of principals, our team of curriculum and instruction staff would then prepare for all three of those scenarios for the start of school. One of the things that I wanted to share with the group is what we would call a program logic model. And this is looking at if we're going from pandemic to remote learning 100%, every child is at home learning online virtually, we would need to walk through what our program would look like. So we start to talk about what are the needs with a remote learning experience. We've started to discuss what are the inputs? How are we gonna communicate this information out and how are we going to prepare our staff for this level of instruction? We identify those activities to support staff and children and families. What are the outputs? And then what is the impact that we wanna have? We wanna provide high level instruction to maximize student learning and to close the gaps that have, um, that we've unfortunately are going to see. We've talked through that same piece if we were looking at hybrid learning. Now we would have the same model if we were gonna talk about social and emotional learning or what instruction would look like within that. When we talk about those hybrid options and we look about what needs to happen instructionally, we've got to consider what are those virtual activities that are going to get students excited, that they're able to complete that work on their own, if it's synchronous or asynchronous instruction. We also need to have um, our students have a voice so that we know what it is that's engaged them, that's getting them excited. And we need to build our teaching and our learning around what we would say are big ideas or those essential standards. 
we've identified those concepts that students need to know to be successful in the next school year. We have to have a plan in place for social and emotional learning as well as academic learning. And we have to conceptualize those learning activities to do on their own. So these are big pieces of the puzzle that we need to be prepared for in August. So what we'd like to do is 100% remote, 100% face-to-face, that's across the board. So what would the potential hybrid plan look like? We have two scenarios that we would like to provide to the school board. We have um, our elementary school. We talked about our data. We talked about the COVID slide. We talked about early literacy and our recommendation was to be able to see students Monday through Friday every day. But we want to support the social distancing. We want to provide every opportunity to keep our staff and students safe. So what we would look at is maintaining a 15 to 1 student ratio, which would be the maximum number of students. Now, we may have an outlier campus. We may have a Hopper or a San Jacinto that has smaller classrooms that we may have to adjust this number. But in the in the grand scheme of things, that would that's what we would be looking at for the majority of our campuses. We would run the school day for Campus A or A elementaries from 745 to 220. We would recommend running those B campuses from 815 to 250. That is 45 minutes earlier than the typical school day. At the end of the school day, we would then provide that um, conference period for the last 45 minutes when students are going home and students would complete their instruction at home um, through an asynchronous model. So we could potentially look at uh, specials being virtual, core content being face-to-face. -face. Um, we need to look at every single space on a campus to ensure that we are minimizing the student-to-teacher ratio within that campus. We also need to evaluate all of our teachers and who is certified to teach because we may need to pull some additional staff in to support those students in that smaller class size ratio. When we look at junior school and we're looking at scenario A, we've talked about doing face-to-face -face Monday through Friday, maintaining that 15 to one student ratio, but running two groups. Half of the students would come in the morning from 7.15 to 11.25, and half of our students would come in the afternoon from 11.25 to 3.35. We could then run our extracurricular activities at the end of the day from 3.35 to 4.35. We would stagger employees' work hours. So not everybody would have a first period, not everybody would have a second period. So it would depend on that student group that you would work with when you would arrive um, to the campus, we would be able to offer five 45 minute classes to our students every day. And then we would have two virtual classes that the students would complete at home. We would recommend a one to one device ratio for our junior school students to support the asynchronous instruction. With our attendance and to achieve your full day of ADA for your students, you need to at least have four hours of instruction. This would meet that requirement. We would be able to support the four hours of ADA with the two periods um, asynchronous, that would meet the required minutes for the school year, the 75,600 minutes that were required to instruct rather than trying to add days throughout the summer. Our high school, we started with one model. Um, I know we heard from one of the, the uh, individuals talking about maybe an AB where they might come in on a Monday and a Wednesday or a Tuesday and a Thursday. We started with that recommendation for high school. When they ran the scenarios um, at the high school campus, they came back and recommended that we also look at a group A and a group B for our high school. So we would be running a nine to one o'clock and a one o'clock to five o'clock. It would be very similar to our junior highs. 
Uh, the only difference is for the high school on Monday and Wednesday, this group of students would do their first four periods face to face. And on Tuesdays and Thursdays, they would do the next four classes face to face. And then on Friday, you would either uh, be able to provide tutorials, you'd be able to work with uh, some of the contact hours when we're talking about CTE certification. Uh, we would be able to have advisory, make up any of those uh, assignments or assessments that a child may have to work on. So that's really what they're looking at within that time frame. On the um, asynchronous days, if I'm doing my first four classes on Monday and Wednesday, my Next four classes would be asynchronous at home in the afternoon. When we look at scenario two, elementary does not change at all. Their times remain the same. The only change we're going to see in scenario two is it bumps junior school to the last start and high school to the first start. Okay. So, so junior high went from the 7.15 start time to the 9 o'clock start time, where high school went from the 9 o'clock start time to the 7.15 start time. So that is something that, that we would ask our board to recommend as far as which scenario, which time frame you would like us to work with with the campuses. I know that there were concerns regarding uh, being able to clean the rooms and the transition of students so that we are minimizing the contact of, of students congregating in large groups. And we would work with our campuses and transportation. We would do a transfer out and in of different uh, wings or uh, regress and egress locations within the buildings. And what we would need to do is equip each classroom. We would do the clean desk setup, and then we would ask our teachers to help us wipe down the desks before the next group came in. Now, within these scenarios, we would build in their conference. We would build in their uh, lunch period. There may be some scenarios, some campuses that we may not have the adequate staff to cover the, the meal time specifically at our elementary campuses. So we may need to look at some extra duty opportunities to take care of our students. Because what we would recommend is our students eat in the classroom rather than congregating and going through those lunch lines. If we have those um, strict guidelines in place to maintain the social distancing for our students. We would also look at opportunities to have teachers move from classrooms versus our students changing classrooms. Understanding that for some CTE, for some elective courses, students would have to transition to that other classroom. Then we talk about virtual instruction. And this is for students not returning to school. I'm going to do 100% instruction at home. And the recommendation from the committee is that we do provide synchronous online instruction. Synchronous means that the students receive the instruction live. It's not recorded. It's not, um, I do it at, I'm going to talk about a high school student at 10 o'clock at night because that's when I'm functioning. It is I log into the classroom, I take my attendance, I participate in the class. What our vision is, is we would identify a fourth grade teacher, a third grade teacher, a sixth grade math teacher who would be the virtual teacher. They would provide the instruction and then we would have a virtual teacher identified, potentially a teacher who's not able to return to the classroom, who would then provide the attendance, the parent contact, they would answer the questions as the questions come through, they would do the progress monitoring, uh, they would provide the support for the students. So we would have teacher A providing instruction, teacher B would be doing all of the grading and all of that communication. Uh, components and that way we're using direct live uh, instruction for our students. We also mentioned in this slide that our high school students 
may need to go the multidisciplinary endorsement just because they would not be able to meet the contact hours for some of the endorsements if they were doing a uh, virtual learning and they were not face to face. So if you think about somebody working on their CNA certification or welding, it's not something that you could do remotely. So we would look at that endorsement so that our students aren't just graduating with a foundation plan. We want to make sure that they have everything in place to, to graduate at that higher level. One of the pieces um, I did want to share with the group when we went over the plan with the task force, we asked for their feedback. So right here, you're going to see elementary, you're going to see junior high, and you're going to see high school feedback. We went through all of that. Majority of it was just questions on how would this work? What would this look like? And so we made sure that we provided feedback to the task force. What we have also done is for our parents, once we've communicated the plan and we let them know these are the three ways we would potentially start school, if we're looking at a hybrid model and you do not want to return or we're looking at 100% face-to-face return to school and you do not want to return, we have a um, registration form for our parents to fill out to register their child for 100% virtual at-home learning. We already have it developed in English and in Spanish, and we go through exactly what would be expected when you do that virtual learning, and then uh, they would fill out all of their students' information. This is a, a way for us to collect data that is specific for that campus, so this will then link to the campus principal and registrar, and they will be able to monitor how many students would not be returning to school we set this up for the parents to understand that if they opt for virtual learning, it is for a six weeks before they can return. What we can't do is have kids popping in and out every week and trying to get them set up in classrooms. So we've set it up where at the six weeks, if a parent wants to now opt out, they have that option to return to face-to-face. -face. And vice versa, if a parent gets concerned or nervous, they're able to um, opt into that virtual instruction. We talked a little bit about the um, social and emotional wellness piece for our students and our staff. And some of the key issues that, that we talked about is we know Closing school was unprecedented. We know our staff and students had to experience something that they may not have necessarily been prepared for. We know that we've got to focus on the social upheaval within our nation. We know that there is a lot of uncertainty. We get new information every week on what's going on. We know that our students are having reactions to what's happened. They didn't get to say goodbye. They didn't get to see their friends. They didn't get to close out a school year. And some of our children and families may have had a very difficult time while quarantined. We know that families may have um, lost their jobs and are having to deal with some hardships right now. So with our reentry plan, we know that we need to acknowledge adult trauma. We know that we have to build those relationships, but also ba balance our academics with our social and emotional support. And we know that we have to connect, collaborate, and communi communicate with our school community. When we talk about professional development, we need to make sure that we are prepared for the synchronous instruction as well as asynchronous instruction. We need to focus on trauma and SEL support for our students, and we need to make sure that that grading policy is aligned to support all learning platforms. Okay, this brings us up into transportation. Okay, Melissa. In transportation, there are a couple of factors we have to look at. The first factor we want to look at is environment. We want to make sure that we still provide a safe, as safe of environment that we can possibly provide for our students. So all buses will be cleaned uh, after the AM and PM routes. We will have hand sanitizer on each bus. We'll be loading the buses um, 
from the rear and according to the route rather than by the grade, this will reduce the student contact. Routes will be driven with the AC units on and the windows down if the bus is equipped with AC and staff and students are required to wear a mask. Okay. Social distancing option um, number one. Uh, we know that we are going to have to reduce the amount of students that we put on our buses and the numbers that we're kind of looking at now is 48. That's two students to each seat. And the only um, alternative to that is if there's a household, a kid, there are students from a household that has three students, they could possibly sit three to a seat. Otherwise, there'll be two to a seat. Now, we're looking at our fleet of 223 buses. We have 42 small wheelchair buses, 1152 passengers, and 170 77 passenger buses. If we look at elementary A, uh, we have approximately four, over 4,600 uh, eligible students to ride those buses. Currently, we are servicing those students with 80 buses. If we go to 48 students per bus, we're going to need an additional 27 buses going up to 107. At the high school, we have approximately 50, over 5,800 students who are eligible to ride the buses. We service those with 94. Um, if we go to 48, we're going to need an additional four buses to go up to 98 buses. Junior high will need to go up to 12 buses, go up to 12 buses for 106. Okay. Our second social distancing option. Uh, is looking at walk zones. Currently, we don't have walk zones, but we would have to look at a one mile or two mile walk zone. Looking at elementary, this may be a little confusing, but if it is, we will uh, get that explained to you. Elementary A, at this time, we currently use 80 buses. If we institute or if we open a walk zone, that would reduce the need by one bus. If that's one mile walk zone. If we go to a two mile walk zone, it could not quite half, but it could drop us down to the need of 48 buses. Let's drop down to the high school. Currently, we have 94 buses servicing those the high schools. If we institute a one mile walk zone, it would go up to uh, 98. That's because of the uh, uh, eligible riders uh, and the current riders. Um, if we go to a two mile walk zone, it would go down to 83, a need of 83 buses. Junior high would be 94. It will go up uh, a little bit because if we went to a one mile walk zone, that would take us up to 105. And if we went to a two mile walk zone, it would uh, take us down to 88 students on that. Okay. Let's Our recommendations for our recommendations for the uh, 2021 school year: buses will be cleaned after all routes, a.m. and p.m. Hand, hand sanitizers must be used by students and staff before loading and unloading the buses. We'll be loading uh, according. We'll be loading and unloading and seating according to route rather than grade. This will reduce the student interaction. Routes will be driven with the windows. Uh, open and AC on if the buses are equipped with AC. And also this also deals with the, the uh, will be determined by the weather. If it's rainy or cold, then of course we will make uh, exceptions to those. Staff and students will be required to wear uh, face masks as they uh, board the buses. Adding 20 to 27 additional drivers and buses is unrealistic at this time. Uh, social distancing on the bus will be limited to trans to the transportation department depending on the needs of our current eligible students and the district uh, campus needs. Our balance of ridership will be uh, at the discretion of uh, the transportation department. Okay. This brings us to safety and security. Facility safety protocols. We are now going to ask that classroom doors remain open during uh, building occupancy. I know that last year and the years past, we have really pressed the issues for doors to be closed and locked. That was for uh, to avoid any 
on-campus intruders. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a new intruder on campus and his name is COVID. And he is coming and he's coming strong. So we're gonna recommend that those doors be open so we can reduce the touch surfaces such as the door handles and knobs uh, to prevent the spread of the virus. We'll also be posting employee guidelines and visitors guidelines and enforcing the six foot uh, social distancing um, protocol and hand sanitize. We will also have this, sanit this signage on all entrances in hallways and in classrooms. Also, if you, we will post this on the motion graphics or the screens in all the offices. It will show the employee guidelines and the visitor guidelines. Uh, what our expectations are. We have installed plexiglass shields in all offices on all campuses. We will we have increased the uh, PPE inventory. And also we uh, have installed a number of foam hand sanitizers across the district and all facilities. We purchased 42 cordless electrostatic sprayers, which are used to disinfect and sanitize facilities and buses. Um, we're also looking at control performance with gases, which is uh, CPG. This is a company that uses, um, they use a uh, antibacterial uh, cleaner that not only cleans the surfaces, but also cleans the air. Um, and not only does it just clean it for the moment, but it is supposed to last from four to six weeks. Um, we are researching this uh, company. They were up in, uh, in Kentucky. And in Kentucky, the only schools that were allowed to remain open were ones who used this company. And um, they had a very good record with uh, decontamination. So we're looking into them. They came out to FMC last week and did a use us as a test site. So we're going to go over the numbers uh, from those tests and see if it's going to be beneficial uh, for us to further investigate the use of that company. Okay. Facility safety visitations. Okay, visitor restrictions. We are going to ask that we only have essential visitations only. That's planned meetings or uh, parent pickup. Um, all visitors will have to go through our rafter uh, screening process. We're going to ask that during school hours, no vendors or facility contractors or sales people uh, coming into the building. We're not talking about those who are working with students or student services providers. We're talking about someone coming in trying to sell something to the school uh, campus uh, principal or something. Um, we're also going to ask that visitors follow the uh, PPP, PPE guidelines and our, um, our protocols. We're going to try and limit the visits to uh, 60 minutes or less. Now we know some meetings may not be able to do that, but that's gonna be our goal is to set a, set a goal and try to maintain that. <clears throat> We're gonna ask that appointments be pre-scheduled to avoid overcrowding in the offices and to allow for social distancing. This brings us to our emergency operations plan. Our school district emergency operations plan are vertically aligned with local, regional, state, and federal plans. GCCISD EOP uh, ensures multi-hazard uh, emergency management. This plan is used to support and ensure the safety of all students and staff ensure, to ensure that they have a safe environment to live, work, and learn. This plan establishes a delegation of authority, operational guidance, and operational sustainability. Our police department, safety and security, our police and security officers will be assigned to campuses according to campus enrollment and campus needs. Uh, patrol officers will continue to patrol uh, the entire district. Our K-9 units will resume proactive building searches and surveillance. Now we did try and get our K-9 units to sniff out the COVID, but they said they wanted hazardous pay for that. So we, we kind of backed off of that. Uh, officers, will be, officers will assist campus administration with new safety regulations and measures.
Okay, so the <laughs> so the district currently has about seventeen hundred iPads um, in our inventory. Huh? Seventeen. Seventeen thousand. Did I say that? Seventeen thousand. Okay. <laughs> Whatever it says on the screen, seventeen thousand. <laughs> uh, uh, we are one to one at the high school. We are currently looking what that will take to convert um, our junior high initiative. We were looking at doing carts uh, anyway with the twenty nineteen bond. Um, what that will look like to convert that to a one to one initiative. Um, we did um, some purchases recently um, in May, and we're looking at doing some more for the fall. Um, our biggest issue is that will struggle with having devices in the classroom and at home. So we can't go one-to-one -one at home and then have carts of iPads in the classroom. Um, but we do believe we have the devices ready for them. We also have uh, a project with the Sprint One Million project. Uh, Robert Lee started that program. We expanded it to uh, Impact and Fury Highland. So we do have uh, 694 hotspots out there at the high school. And we are looking at how we can expand that program to all of our locations. We do know that roughly about 12% of our uh, students do not have reliable internet at the house. Um, currently, T-Mobile is merging with Sprint, if you're, if you're following that in the news. So we're kind of waiting on what that looks like. Um, I've also been on a couple of conversations with T-Mobile on what it would look for us to, to, to buy outright. And then also, I was on a call last week with Mayor Turner's office. Um, has a Houston regional initiative for uh, eliminating the digital divide, and it had superintendents and other CTOs from from the Region Four area about trying to get together as a as a larger group um, and and making purchases on hotspots or devices. Next slide. Um, and so that slide there is our data showing our internet access at home. This was last year's data. Um, we do ask that during our online registration process. So as parents are filling out their online registration, they're asking, they're answering questions about do they have internet at home. So we're hoping to have better numbers um, going into the fall as as parents complete registration. Like I said, this is from last September. On average, you see twelve percent, and you can see it kind of follows um, based off the pre and reduce kind of makeup at per campus kind of changes. Next slide. Okay, this brings us to operational services. Protocols for school reopening. Uh, we will ensure that our staff practices routine cleaning and disinfectant of, of frequently, frequently touched surfaces. We'll also uh, ensure that we have adequate cleaning and sanitary uh, supplies available for all campuses and district needs. We will identify and post signage for high touch surfaces and at the cleaning of classrooms in the evenings, our evening custodial staff will use the electrostatic backpack sprayers to disinfect and sanitize um, our facilities as well as our buses. We'll ensure that custodial staff completes deep cleaning training. They will also continue to uh, monitor and uh, implement temperature checks and self screenings. Um, our custodial staff will work hours modified to accommodate campus and student needs throughout the district. We are we have added a uh, cleaning agent to our uh, wax that inhibits the growth of bacteria on the floors to help prevent the spread of virus. Going into nutritional services, our nutritional services are we are standing at the ready to uh, adapt to whatever model. Um, that we decide to go with, whether it's at home or uh, distance learning, the staggered schedule, um, limited contact, full attendance, or full attendance with um, no limitations. Um, next slide. Our meal service delivery plan. Uh, right now, uh, with the elementary, we are looking at a uh, breakfast in the classroom, lunch in the classroom, uh, for the junior high and high school, we will look at the uh, morning groups, breakfast, grab and go, eat in the classroom, uh, morning group, lunch, grab and go, take out to car or bus on the, as they're exiting the building. Afternoon group will do a grab and go lunch and eat in the classroom. And uh, after school group will have a grab and go supper to take out 
uh, to their bus to the bus or car as they're exiting the building. If you look up under the elementary at the very bottom, we do have curbside grab and go for all students. All students not in school. All students will have a, have access to uh, breakfast and lunch, but those will be for our online learners. We will still provide uh, breakfast and lunch for them. That completes our presentation. All right, I'd like to open it up for any questions of the Board of Trustees to uh, our executive team members who presented to you the plan this evening. I'd like to cover just a couple of highlights. Primarily what we're looking for from the Board of Trustees in endorsement of this plan with edits or modifications that you may bring to us tonight. A couple of things just for you to note that you may have been uh, taking notes along the way is uh, we're looking at AM or PM dedication for junior higher high school. We want to emphasize the fact that uh, for, throughout the summer, we've sort of been dependent upon uh, interpretations of uh, commissioner's rulings. We've been waiting on executive orders from our governor. And what we believe at this point in time, having attended many, many, many uh, WebExes and Zooms uh, with each of these entities, is that uh, it's up to school districts to make a decision what's best now. Uh, you, as the elected officials of this community, will um, have the governance um, gloves on tonight in determining whether we open or we don't open, whether we start back or not. Administration's job to, this evening was to present a plan to you, uh, vetted by uh, our best practices, best based upon stakeholders' input and feedback, looking at all the elements that we possibly can, but primarily as your superintendent of schools, um, what we're seeking tonight is your endorsement to support our flexibility also. For example, you heard tonight mention that Currently, our buses can't transport every single kid every single day under the current schedule. Uh, we are blessed to have uh, some buses on order uh, through our 2019 bond that will be arriving, I believe, Mr. Walterside, in September. So it will be right at the beginning of the year. We'll be receiving 30 new buses, which will assist us in this process. But it may be the case if we were to have 100 percent of students every day. Uh, at school that we would need parents to assist with transportation. Those are the types of things that we want to make aware and be transparent about uh, going forward. The other thing is that uh, also in the bond um, pending acquisition is uh, more computers for the one-to-one -one initiative that we've uh, proposed tonight in pushing our one-to-one -one initiative at the high school into the junior highs. Currently, as you know, based upon the presentation, we have pods where kids can check out uh, iPads, but we don't distribute them to all of the junior high students. That would be a change in what we would do, and it could have financial uh, need behind that, but currently it's covered under our uh, bond. The other thing I would say is many of the things we're making adjustments and adaptions are because we're under a pandemic. These are not things we want to do. These are not things that we, we um, are sitting here planning to do under normal circumstances, but it is uh, our obligation to educate the students within this community, and I think the plan that has been presented to you this evening is uh, is a good foundation for where we can start. We would, uh, if you picked up on Dr. Dorte's presentation, we have a whole other, uh, we, we set the parameters tonight. The next step is to begin the registration process. No more surveys, but actual registration uh, data that we would be dependent upon parents and faculty members uh, that would help guide and shape the campus master schedules and registration and things of that nature. So um, tonight you have before you those challenges to answer and to endorse and or modify the plan as we presented it to you. Um, we'll open up the floor now for any questions prior to any type of adoption. Um, I have a few. Uh, first on the bus, on the transportation, uh, Dr. Price and Mr. Walterscheid, is there any way we can employ a bus service or rent buses for the year? Is that even an uh, option? That is an option. We haven't looked into it, but uh, it's certainly something we could look into. Um, in addition to that, I know that one of the plans, uh, my, my biggest concern is elementary because would not that would that problem not be solved if we went to a hybrid system with two shifts for our junior high and high school? Okay, say that again, sir. So the, the concern is elementary because if we go to a height for secondary, I'm sorry, we have to be back. <laughs> but for secondary, 
we have a morning shift and an afternoon shift. Would that not help alleviate that problem? Oh, with the with using a bus service along with our service? Oh, just with our service alone, if we can figure out those groups based on geographic location. I would have to defer that to question to Mr. Waldershot. I don't think we're going to be able to have enough transportation to take care of all of that, though. Can you hear me that? Yeah. Okay. The main thing that we're going to have an issue with on that is going to be time. If you look at uh, the overall scope and time of where we, when we pick up the very first student in the morning and we drop the last student, there is very, very little time right. at all. I think what we're going to do is keep up. Mr. Walterstein. Can you hear me? It's yeah. better. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, what we're going to, what we're probably most likely going to find uh, is that we're going to have a, a good number of parents that live very close that are going to be transporting students. I don't think that we need to look at walk zones. I think that we uh, we we have a very talented transportation department, uh, and that we can probably most likely, and I, that doesn't sound the greatest to say that, but we are very, uh, we anticipate that we will be able to meet the needs of 48 students per bus as long as we maintain that brothers and sisters can sit together up to three per seat. And uh, just looking at the numbers that we trans last year, we're averaging fewer students than 48 per bus. So there is a chance that they will be greater than that going to parts like um, uh, an apartment complex, if you will, uh, if you will uh, uh, in certain areas, or a daycare. Uh, I'll, I'll use a daycare that we go to up in Highlands area. We have two bus walks that go there uh, from Hopper Primary. They're all going to the same daycare, uh, depending on the number of students that would get on that bus. That would be probably one we would not want to uh, social distance a great deal on because they're all going to the same place um, and being dropped off at the same time. Uh, I feel very confident in looking at the plans that have been placed here that we can meet the needs of the district with them. I have one other question in terms, and this for Dr. Duarte, in terms of extracurriculars, uh, I saw somewhere on here for the um, extracurriculars, especially, I guess, the athletics and the band and the choir and orchestra, that they're either going to be early in the morning or late in the afternoon. Or make any plans for, as far as these instructors staying extra early and extra late? So, okay. So, what we were looking at is not only would they potentially have the class built into their schedule, specifically at the high school or that elective at the junior high, we would offer either that early or after school. I know that they already provide that through the stipend that they receive being a head band or a, an athletic person. If we're looking at having to extend their day even more, like we talked about, um, maybe not having a duty free lunch and being able to compensate the staff, then we would put that proposal together so that the bear board would be fully aware of the cost we would need to incur. I'm sorry, you would do that through giving them, say that again? second part so then what we would do is put that recommendation together and do a cost analysis so that the board would be fully aware of the um, amount of funding we would need to support the teachers because the stipend as i understand is for when they're in season you know they have to take extra time but we're asking them to come in an hour earlier and leave an hour later than everybody else it, That's two hours a day. So um, that again be dependent on the season. So you may not have a certain extracurricular group staying in the morning or coming in the afternoon. It would coincide with their calendar. So, for example, if, I'll just myself, I'm a, and I know I'm in another district, but as a soccer coach, I wouldn't see my kids until my season started. Well, no, if they have that in their schedule and, and they have that athletic period, then you would see them on the Monday and Wednesday or the Tuesday and Thursday and potentially on the Friday when we have that uh, flexibility to do additional contact time. But we would have to, at 
once it's approved and we're going to move forward, then we will have to figure out all of those outlying questions that we need to be able to answer for our staff, for our community, and for our board. And this is where the campus principal comes into play. They begin to have these meetings with various coaches, fine arts directors at the campus level. And for example, I can't picture a scenario where they, uh, the coach uh, outside of being in season would be before and after. So the design would be you'd be one or the other, not both. But I think it's important for us to have a uniform answer so that one school's not doing one thing and another's doing another. Great. Um, the only one last comment, and then I'll be quiet. Uh, I have a, a real concern. I, I, I talked to Dr. O'Brien. I think he asked everybody how we felt about coming back. And my only real concern is that we can either do it now and worry about when somebody's going to come home. I mean, I've come to school with, unfortunately, with, them, with COVID. And then we have to get out of school and all that stuff. Or we start virtual now. And then later we come back when when things have been normalized for everybody. Everybody in the state's dealing with this issue. I would just hate to rush this for the sake of all the kids, especially, and also our teachers and everybody else. Yeah, I, I would like to piggyback on that. And what I've heard from a number of teachers that I've spoken with is, you know, they would be willing to go into the classroom teach from a virtual setting inside their classroom, teaching kids at home. I, I know that this is a lose-lose situation for everybody, right? Uh, I mean, you guys uh, have put together an amazing plan, set of plans, but this is an imperfect situation. This is a worst-case scenario in a lot of ways. And and so with worst scenarios, uh, there's there's going to be some difficult decisions to to that you have to wrestle with. Um, you've got on one hand, you've got the fidelity to the education process and and to student learning. And on the other hand, you've got health and, and you can't really sacrifice one for the other, either one. Um, that's a that's a struggle that you guys have all gone through uh, with with tremendous care. And I and I see that in the plan. Um, as a, as a parent, I want my kids safe. As a parent, I know I'll do everything I can to help them shore up those areas of learning. But I also know that there aren't always parents involved. And I also know that there is the digital divide that people may not have access. Having said all of that, I still go back to that virtual classroom with the teachers teaching with students logged in. Uh, there's just something about that that I, I feels like it's the right answer, but that's just me. It's not, I'll jump in there too. Uh, Can I just share something really quick? Because in our, so we do have that as an option. And, and, and right. yes. yeah, we're fully aware that that may happen. Um, what I do want to share is we looked a lot at our data from the last nine weeks and we did not, um, we did a great job in a very quick turnaround to try and support our students' education. What we know now is we are mandated to take attendance every day, whether it be asynchronous or synchronous instruction. There has to be a way for us to evaluate students who are attending their classes. When we look at the last nine weeks of school, and that's one quarter of the school year, we had everything from 99.99% of our students participating at a campus to 30% of our students not participating at a campus. And that was with, you could do everything on Monday and be done for the entire week. You could work midnight if you wanted to. You could do it on the weekends. Um, it also included packets for students that were having difficulty. Uh, we had a lot of feedback from parents because um, I was one of the lucky ones that got to scan all those packets when they came into our campuses. 
And we were getting notes from parents. I don't know how to help my child. I don't understand what this is. We did the best that we could. And then I think about teaching children to read and, and our early literacy and our primary grades. And that's why we struggled with, like you said, you know, is it is it just the safety? Is it the instructional integrity of our students' ability to learn? And, and it's that balance that I think, you know, we're trying to look for to yeah. maximize the needs of our community and our students. So I, I did want to share that data because I think it's important. Overall, we had 93% participate. And out of the 93%, 5% of our students did packets. So it, it kind of gives us some numbers. And if you think of 10% of our population, that's 2,400 students. So we had about 1,200 students do packets and nothing online. So on that, following that same exact uh, train of thought is uh, I, I made reference to uh, the WebExes and Zooms that I've been on all, you know, for the last nine weeks. Um, and much of the conversation evolved around fidelity. You mentioned that also, Mr. Cotter. Um, I believe that Goose Creek did a phenomenal job getting technology into the hands of students, families who did not have technology. Uh, the training of teachers all transpired in a, in, in a week's time. And uh, we got onto our platforms. And as, as Dr. Dorte said, 93% were engaged. Um, what was communicated clearly is not all schools across the state or the nation did that. So um, in, the, in the fact that we did it is phenomenal. However, there were percentages that would anyone in this room would deem unacceptable of participation. Um, and that was where they just had to check in once a day to confirm they were doing their assignments for the day. The rulings, as I'm understanding them from our, from our uh, commissioner, are that attendance must be taken every day, every period, for every child, which is significantly different than what we had in the spring. So um, that is in order for us to continue to be funded as an organization, as an entity. Um, so the attendance is going to drive it. Uh, the only flexibility we have is how we do that. So um, that was some of the, the foundation that was put into the committee when we first formed up and started, how do we do this? So clearly, um, they're, they're, you know, you've seen the model, uh, whether we go 100% virtual or 100% face-to-face -face or a hybrid in between, the attendance is the key driver for funding for, for all of this, for any of this to happen. So the uh, earlier questions were whether or not funding would be at 100% if we went virtual or not. Those are the earlier uh, prompts and cues. Uh, most recently, we did have legislators come on to one of our witnesses and confirm we will be funded fully, whether we're virtual or face-to-face. Uh, it didn't change the fact that we're still trying to weigh out what's best for children. Some of the research that was presented at the task force was about emotional well-being of our students. You know, uh, students need social engagement, interaction with other students. Some are dependent upon our, our nutritional services. Um, so all of that has weighed into this committee's decision. But you're, you said it right, Mr. Cotter, that it's a it's not a win-win situation, and that's what we always try to have in public education. The good news for you is that. We're not partisan. We only care about these children. How can we serve these children? How can we serve this community? So all of the time and energy that went into this, I can assure you, was based purely on how can we deliver a quality education to the students and families of Goose Creek in a safe manner? That's ultimately what drew every single question that was, went into this presentation. Uh, it's not perfect. It's uh, You can find a lot of flaw in it, but it's a starting point and what our a desire would be after tonight is to present it to our principals as a go and then have them find those pitfalls that we may have and then send it back to us and, uh, and then you would be receiving future presentations on this as well that would refine and hopefully uh, prepare us for the start of the school year in about five weeks. Okay. I, I would agree with my fellow board members who have already spoken about beginning school virtually but I like to use some data and some statistics that I will make a disclaimer are mine, but they're based on numbers that anybody can agree or anybody can look up and get from the CDC or Harris County. But based on our current COVID infection rate in Texas, I have about a one in 3,700 chance of catching COVID sitting here right now. And if we assume that each student is 
being socially distanced from everybody except their sibling, their mom, their dad, and maybe their grandparents, they contact five people on average a day. And when we put those kids in a classroom based on the numbers that were given today, that's going to be 485 contacts for the bus driver yep. and bring the bus driver's odds to one in eight of contracting COVID. It's going to make our uh, high school teachers be exposed to 605 contacts or one in six. It's going to make our junior highs exposed to 755 contacts or one in five chance. And those numbers are scary. And I would just hope that we would look at that data and keep our adults safe as well as our kids safe. Yes. There's no telling how many they're going to share walking to and from places, even if we do our very best to keep them distanced. Right. Uh, the other thing is, uh, if we own 17,000 iPads already, we're not that far away in the big picture of one-to-one, -one, and I'll be happy to donate my board iPad to the cause. I would too. And the, the and, well, and the other, I say that with tongue in cheek to a point, but I know there are a whole bunch of students when I was teaching that didn't even take the offered iPad because they had their own. Yeah. So, you know, I bet we are closer to one to one than we think we are. And then, yes, sir. Then, then the hot spots, you know, I like everything Mr. Flood had to say about that. I also believe that the fidelity of education will go up from where it was this past nine weeks if our teachers are sitting in their classrooms with access to teams and check and roll every hour and that we as a district do the same procedures on that campus where 30% were not participating. It, get Officer Alfredo and his team knocking on doors and get our truant officers doing what they do. Um, we can have real school online with fidelity and a quality product. I don't think we can teach kindergartners to read online. No. I don't. I I just don't. I, well, I have. Yeah. Something I, something has to be. I I don't have the solution to that, but I'm working on it. But I you know, there are certain things we just you can't teach you can't teach patterning on on an iPad. And, and we know that, but uh, at this and point, I, I think in. we have to stay safe. And that's and I'll be in right and a half work. Yes, sir, sure. jump in. Um, we have, we talk about virtual. Uh, on the average, we have how many seniors that graduated from our senior class? 1,600. No, I'm talking about how many we have for graduation. We have 1,500 graduate every year? 16 yes, or more, yeah. They graduate, walk across the stage. Yes, sir. 1,500? Yes, sir. Okay. So, seniors are supposed to be more mature than everyone else that's there. Why couldn't it be where the senior class does virtual assignments and we have freshmen, sophomore, and juniors, if possible, come to school. Now that's just me throwing out a, a suggestion. Everything else we put together, that's fine. And my second question is the cleaning of the different schools after everyone, if we have face-to-face, -face, are we gonna have like so many people personnel uh, assigned to each school to clean all day, or are we just going to come PM and A? Yes, sir. That's what I was re referencing. We need uh, the board support to expand funding for various things like iPads, buses, and then people. So people are one of the equations that I would be bringing forth to the board for surplus um, positions and. There, there's good news and bad news. Some people are saying that the CARES Act may enable us to be reimbursed for COVID expenditures. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't hold our breath on that. Okay. Are we going to, um, like, it, say at Sterling, you, you have a, a certain person 
uh, assigned to a certain wing of the building on the second story of three or four, which that's what you're talking about, trying to hire more people. Yes, sir. Just to give an example, each secondary, each, each high school campus may have five or six custodians. We may have to add two to each campus, three to each campus, may, and may have to double it. But that will be determined uh, over time based upon um, the, the need as we get in there and start um, acting. Yeah, because I'm, I'm kind of uh, afraid that if we go face to face, that the first thing that happened, the first, like we just said, the first time we have someone who contracted the virus, then we got to shut down. Uh, and have certain students, how are you gonna track who this person came in contact with in order to be able to quarantine them? So uh, we have had a little bit of experience with that over the summer. We have uh, 100 people that work in this building uh, are at Central Administration Building. And it, we've used that basically as a data driver to determine what would happen. And we have two scenarios, one in which someone contracts COVID and they're, uh, relegated to go home for 14 days. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then the other one is just um, contact association. And that requires a negative test to return to work. So it's two different elements, but um, we've talked about this at the executive level and, and welcome to have this conversation here as well. What we present to you is a plan. We know that plans will is subject to change. Uh, if, for example, uh, half of a campus's teachers are not able to come to work, then uh, we would be virtual on that campus. Uh, we've had ranges on the statistics, our surveys. Let's say surveys aren't the real deal. It's just sort of how do you feel kind of thing. And now a couple of weeks old, they're even dated, but we had as many as 82% of our staff say, we're ready to go. Let's get back to work. I had uh, a single campus report 98% ready to go back to work and go face to face. So, um, but, all that's just surveys. We're here tonight to talk about what we will actually do and our, our plans. And we're here to serve this community and to serve this board, this governing board, to, to give us the, the direction on which we feel like, you feel like, it will be the safest uh, opportunity for our kids to get a quality education. The only um, debate item on 100% virtual is those social emotional needs that were referenced in the presentation. They're absolutely completely, you're completely dependent upon a parent to provide all of the social emotional needs. Um, and we've probably all are related to someone who has a kid in school who even in the spring, had, we had depression issues and things of that nature. So we're concerned about missing out on that opportunity to provide that service to the kiddos. But uh, we're here to, to hear it all out. So I welcome more board members to share your thoughts and ideas. If, I have if a question. We, what is the, sorry. Uh, what is the uh, my this is my final thing? Uh, <laughs> you know, social distancing and everything. But when you talk about athletics, there's no social distance. We can see that with everything going on now. You know, in football, there's no social distance. Basketball, there's no social distance. In volleyball, there's no. So, have we heard from the state? or we heard from our uh, athletic director what he's planning or how his plan is gonna fit in with the, the actual teaching and learning that our kids are uh, having to do. I mean. Yes, sir, we're. That's UIL. Yeah, I'm saying UIL, have we and heard there, anything? There, we, we, we've had updates on that. They're all over the table also. Okay. Yes, sir, but they, the UL is the regulated body for those decisions. Yeah. Are we going to input and, and have any type of temperature readings for kids that come into the school every day, or have local station where they can get their temperature and everything taken? Yes, sir. Every entrance has a um, thermometer. Okay. Yeah. I didn't hear that in the uh, plan, but I was curious to know. That's it for me. I have a couple questions and one of them kind of relates to him. Um, during passing periods for the high schools, um, will they be required to wear masks or anything like that? Or That's up for discussion today. Okay. We, what I would share with you is this, the, the background on that is the commissioner of education um, elected to 
provide the masks to all school districts mm -hmm. throughout the state of Texas. Uh, rather than us purchase them, they're just being provided to the school district based upon our average daily mm -hmm. attendance. So we will be initially provided masks, uh, sanitizer to support every student every day for the fall semester. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we will be provided. So whether or not every student every day will utilize those items, but that will be our recommendation. So we okay. talked a little bit about that mm -hmm. and what we talked about is when students are in those common areas, they're coming into the school, they're leaving the school, they're going to go to the restroom. Uh, when mm -hmm. they get in those common areas, we would expect them to wear their masks. Once they okay. are at their seat, social distanced, then we would let them remove the mask. So that was some of the conversations we've had about that. Perfect. And then, so another question I had, I know like so on the junior high start, I mean, times right here that I'm looking at um, the group A ends the same time group B starts. So as far as like transition times between groups, um, where will group B be housed while group A is being released to go to bus or go home or something like that? I don't know um, that you could send them to the classroom at that time because they'll still have group A in the classroom. Um, so. The only reason we did the back to back was because of transportation and they needed to be able to pick up students and drop them off and then take right. students on their way. Mm -hmm. And so that would be one of the um, procedural guidelines that we would put together for our campuses to minimize the contact of our students. And it could be based upon a case by case per campus. If there's an east side of the building and a west side of the building entering and exiting, uh, the, the transportation could line up accordingly. Right, but the students still have to gather at a spot yeah. until they can go to their classroom. That's, I think that's my only concern about that. Um, I did like when the, one of the letters that was read, um, she talked about maybe doing A, B days um, and then maybe alternating Fridays or something, or you could use it for tutorials. But if you didn't split it by grade level, if you split it by um, alphabet or something, you know, then you're, because I know one of the concerns with having, you know, the freshmen and sophomores go in a certain day or certain days and then juniors and seniors go on the certain days, you may have English 4 teachers trying to teach English 1 and all that kind of stuff. But if you did it alphabet, um, then it kind of splits it a little bit more evenly. So then maybe they could do full days instead of having to split the day. Um, I don't know. I just feel like the back to back times would be would be tough. And if we're really going to try to social distance, um, you know, and, and I agree, I think we have to have a face to face option. Parents, some parents, not all parents, but some parents do want their kids to come back to school because they do need the social interaction and they do need the extra support that we can provide them um, educationally at school that they may not get at home. Um, and so, you know, and I was having to call students for since March, March to May, I was calling students, you know, the same parents and, and students every week because they were struggling to, to be motivated to be online. Yeah. Um, and so I feel like fate for those types of students, the face to face is just really the best option. Um, and I know they're, it's just a hard, it's just hard. And I think, uh, I want to thank Dr. Duarte, Dr. Price and and Mr. Flood and y'all's teams, y'all have worked so hard since March to do, to get our kids, um, to, to just keep them on track as much as possible at the end of the year. And you've been working all summer to help um, start school year, start the new school year um, smoothly. So I thank y'all for that. Um, but anyway, those are my concerns. Thank but you. I think they should be mandatory that they wear a mask while they're in the school because try to make them have social distance it's going to be right. a job for more than one person but i'd rather them not pass germs between each other as long as they have masks and another thing is when they dropped off the school or uh, whatever we like we said in the report not have any outside person come in they come to school mm -hmm. parents can't come in or nothing unless it's something that they have to be in there and they need to wear a mask to come into the school or, or see anyone in the office. But if the mask works, then maybe we can cut down on any type of uh, passing of germs with everybody that are together. 
because as people flow through the school, there's not going to be any social distance unless you treat right. it like, like uh, little kids and have a line where they have to walk on or something. But we need to have masks mandatory uh, for, for parents, teachers, kids, everything. Because the first time that we get a, a, a dozen kids that have uh, COVID and everybody's going to scream, why didn't you have them wear a mask? And I think that's a when, not an if. Yeah, well, when, yeah, just right. I have, a, I have one question. I know I probably asked a lot, but I'm going to keep asking. <laughs> so, if if a teacher is in a classroom and a kid contract con, a kid has COVID, and the teacher, I know y'all send out some correspondence in regards to that. And what if they come back and another kid has COVID or test positive for COVID? Are we going to take away the teacher's days for that? Uh, what happens then? If a, and what happens to the rest of the classroom? Quarantine. Other, I can't hear with this thing. With any other situation, whenever you have in a job site where somebody gets COVID tested positive, everybody has to go get tested. Here we have a teacher with 15 kids in the morning, 15 kids in the afternoon. Plus, you know, I think your numbers that you shared, Mr. Clem, are going to be a lot worse because if a, if a kid gets COVID and the teacher has to step out and is gone for two weeks and we've had the doctor FMLA and then they come back and another kid gets COVID, another kid tests positive. Now they're going to take, and it's not fair to teachers and it's not fair to the rest of the kids. And I'm not blaming that child. No. I mean, ultimately, I, I saw a meme that is kind of scary because it had a little girl and it said, my mom said I could come to school even though I had COVID because I took medicine this morning. And unfortunately, we're going to have those situations. Where are we there to protect our, our teachers that have to deal with all the all the children in these situations? Yeah. What are we going to do to the school district? I mean, are we going to have to take away their FMLA every time? What if they run out of days? And and we're going to see this scenario over and over and over. Um, am I muted? No. no. Okay. No, you're good. Um, <laughs> yeah. My, you know. Just take, for instance, my son, my oldest, he, he works at a business here and the manager got infected. So what did they do? They had to shut down, gave everybody testing. Everybody returned. Somebody else showed up positive. This, ha this, is, this is just happening. And, and I think to protect the, the, the health of everyone involved, primarily, that's our first and foremost thing. If we can't protect their health, then not just students, but teachers and faculty, um, then, then what are we educating for? And, and it sounds like to me that if we go virtual, yes, we've got some issues we're going to have to figure out. But you know what? We've also, we are in the most technologically advanced moment in time to be able to handle those issues. I mean, we've got, we've got therapy sessions online now. We've got all sorts of ways that we can have. I know that before we even had this issue at Lee High School with their technology, they were, there were kids in classrooms doing math problems on an iPad and kids don't feel comfortable looking stupid in front of a classroom. So they don't ask questions. They don't, they're afraid. They're, they're, they've got such insecurity about that stigma. But now they don't have to raise their hand. They don't have to ask questions. They can click a button. The teacher can see a student asking a question on their iPad. They can get those answers handled with the ease of a button, with complete discretion, and we can utilize that technology to take care better of our student body, of our of our emotional well-being, of our learning curve. We've got so many tools at our disposal. I think we've got a much better chance of handling the shortfalls of the virtual classroom than we do of handling the shortfalls of a face-to-face -face scenario. Yeah. I think one of the things that, that we were asking for is, I'm going to use the word blessing, to plan for both. We would like to be able to start to prepare for if it is 
completely 100% virtual because what we do with curriculum is going to look potentially different than we have the blessing to move forward with the hybrid model because our team needs to map out um, instruction and professional learning for our staff before they return with students, the curriculum documents. So our hopes are we can be prepared to offer both venues and then when we get closer to the start of school, the board would look at all of the data, all of the cases in the area and tell us, all right, this is what we're gonna go with, but at least we're prepared for both sides. And, and so that's really the guidance that we were hoping we could get on the instructional side, that yes, we could look at a 100% virtual and yes, we can look at a hybrid model and then mm -hmm. make that determination is, was our hopes. Well, <clears throat> my thoughts, can, can you hear me? I don't hear myself, okay. My thoughts on the issue are that we have to move forward with both. Right, right. That we, we don't have a choice at this point because as of the surveys, which obviously would be different today than they were when we sent them out several weeks ago, even at that point in time, we had over half of the parents who responded said they would not send their children back in August. And this is before we resurged with the coronavirus in our community and before the, the governor even expanded his uh, regulations on masks and uh, community gatherings. So because we are not the ultimate deciders of what is going to be the situation in August, because we will have to defer to what the county and the state is recommending, what the CDC is recommending, we have to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. So we have to be prepared for 100% virtual. And then if you have teachers who say, no, I want to be in my classroom, and you have parents who say, I do want my children in the classroom, then those are the ones that we allow to come in if at that time we are allowed to allow that. Um, but we already had a great number of parents, those that did respond, because I'm sure we had plenty who did not, but the ones that did, over half of them said they were not comfortable and did not intend to send their children back in August. So, you know, I'm sorry, Mr. Walterscheid, but your transportation <laughs> questions are going to be a nightmare. Um, yeah. We don't know how many children you're going to have to transport every day to the elementary, junior high, high school campus. I would expect that the ones who have been car riders in the past are going to continue to be car riders in the future. So that's not an issue to really consider. But I would expect your numbers are going to be lower than what you are projecting them to be, whether we go to walk zones or, or not. So um, I agree with Ms. Guy when she's uh, voicing her concerns about the transition times at the junior school. I was a fan of the A, B days where we had maybe A through L students on Mondays and Wednesdays and Tuesdays and Thursdays or M through Z. Um, that minimizes the number of students that could possibly be on a campus in the same day. It minimizes the, the potential number of contacts. But Mr. Clem's numbers are still very scary yeah. <laughs> because it does expand mm -hmm. your field of sure. potential contacts no matter, no matter what. Um, I think that what we're doing here today is just putting it all out on the table and understanding that we really don't know what situation we're going to be in three weeks from now, four weeks from now, six weeks from now, but we have to be prepared to meet that demand. We, we need to be ready to spend money on the issue when it comes to increasing custodial staff um, aiding teachers in the classroom with sanitation between classes in the hallways all day long, constantly contact points. And I applaud you, Dr. Price, for all of the uh, efforts that you've put into examining where these 
where these risks are going to be the highest. Yeah. Um, all of you, all of you, Dr. Duarte, y'all have worked very, very hard because you've had the biggest puzzle thrown at you. <laughs> and there's pieces everywhere, pieces everywhere, and nobody knows what the picture is supposed to look like. So, um, I don't, I don't know if we can decide if we're a hundred percent or if we're so the, hybrid. The, the, the foundational premise the, of the committee was how do we educate children? And, um, the idea or the concept would be to ideally it would be face to face, but under circumstances such as a pandemic, not so much. What we had hoped to do tonight in essence is just get a couple of these, um, items that I mentioned earlier, it uh, uh, sounds to me like we have your support for financial expenses that we would incur in, in anything, whether it ranges from sanitation or technology or transportation, we would have your consent. And I appreciate that. We don't take that lightly because that's, that's, that weighs heavy on a board to know you may have a couple million dollars here and there that's coming from our fund balance. And, and with your endorsement, we can go forward with a plan to address all of our students' needs. Uh, but secondly, it's face-to-face uh, -face or, or uh, and the hybrid model is what I think the committee felt like we would lean towards, a uh, possibility of tonight, I think Dr. Dorte's intentions were tomorrow morning to release um, the opportunity for parents to register their child one way or yes. the other. And with that information, yes. we have real data at the next board meeting and at that board meeting we could uh, I think have a little bit more solid information for you rather than, like you said, outdated survey information. This would be registration information. Yes, I want my child to come to school. Yes, I want him to go to class every single day, all periods, whatever you're offering, whether it's half day or full day, we want our kids in school. Or no, I'm going to, uh, we have the technology in our home. I want my child to register and, and do all things virtual. So the registration process will give us actual data versus survey data. Right. My only concern about that is that we're, this is July 6th, yeah. and we're still six weeks away from, you know, four, I, when does school start? Five weeks. Five, <laughs> five, weeks. Weeks. five weeks away. I've been on vacation. Ah. And we're, but yeah, I mean, yeah. we, in, in between now and then, of course, I, I don't think it's too early. I don't think it's too early to have parents start making some type of a decision because ultimately that's who has to make the decision for their children. We can only do our best to provide services and you all have worked very hard to make many options available. I think that's where we have to be. So parents will have to decide if they're comfortable sending their children onto campuses. Um, and then we are assuming a risk that there will be children there who bring virus in, the flu comes in, the stomach virus, the all kinds of illness come onto our campuses every year, head lice, measles, chicken pox. That's something that we have faced every year since the beginning of time. Um, so this, this will be something that has to be handled in a new way. But if we can minimize the risk by increasing our practices, our safe practices and our cleanliness, that's the best we can do. We still have to educate children. So the, the, one of the, the uh, parts of this model is that would allow uh, uh, you know, the saying, stay home if you, uh, you know, be no, safe I, and stay home if you think you're sick. Uh, the, ace, the synchronous model would allow the student to stay home on a day that even if they were a face-to-face -face kid, they could stay home and go synchronously and check into that class. So that's, that's a way that the right. students could feel safer about staying home if they're feeling puny or a sick stomach or some of the symptoms, they would stay home, but still log in and get credit for attendance that day. And more than anything is get the instruction that they need to stay up with their peers. Right. And the option for parents to every six weeks change that. Um, and there may be case by case during that six week period, obviously, that the situation would change. If you want your children to stay at home and learn virtually, then all the tools are there for you. Um, if you feel like your children need to be on a campus with a teacher face to face with other students for their social emotional learning, then that ultimately has to be a parent's decision for their children. 
And we talked about setting it up where it would be three weeks for the um, campus staff to determine so you can look at the progress reports and uh, their ability to work through that virtual environment. Yeah, because you, you got a lot of teachers may not want to come and be face to face and especially teachers who have small kids at home who are afraid of coming in and bringing something back home. Uh, we have to look at that also. Right. And I think the models that were presented with, you know, with fewer students on campus, there obviously is opportunity for teachers co-teaching, some teaching virtually from home. I know we had a really high amount of teachers say they were ready to come back on campus, but for those that are not, they you know need to be set up virtually and if it is synchronous or even if it's asynchronous those teachers are still going to be able to reach their students um as as we go to one-to-one -one as close as we can for uh technology with our students but we also gonna have to have a lot of support from parents on the ones who want to go from home about the same measure of them getting them up and getting them ready for school just like they do if they were going to school and we need to have that backing from the from the parents also that's adoption of the synchronous model so dr duarte i have a question um well first of all i'm glad that we're making having this conversation after it was too late for teachers to resign because <laughs> <laughs> we would have been in a lot of trouble just hearing what i'm hearing i'm, I'm you know, right uh, how many, so two things, number one, how many, well, just one, when kids found out that if they didn't, if they didn't come to COVID summer school, there was a strong possibility they were not going to pass the grade. Did the numbers of kids connected increase or, or the participation? So if I'm a kid that didn't go to, that didn't go connect or didn't do anything, and then I got a call or a phone call, a phone call or a knock on the door, and said, hey, if you don't go to COVID summer school, you are not going to, you're going to fill the grade. It was, did we see a significant increase? That's part one of my question. Yes, we did see improvement when we sent out the communication specifically to those that had Fs for their progress report. Okay. So the second part is, and, and this is not so much a question, but what if we did that and said, hey, you know what? If you don't connect, if you don't, you're not going to pass your grade, you will not graduate, we're not playing, there is no, I mean, I think that that was one of the things that maybe because we were so new to COVID, you know, it was a, a relatively new thing, and, and I'm sorry, I don't really think it's like the flu, it's a little, this thing kills people a lot faster than the flu does, but because of, of we were new to it, I think we gave a lot of leeway, leeway that now I think people have, have kind of grown into seeing what we're dealing with, could we not maybe put that sense of urgency into parents and students saying, hey, if you don't log in, you're going to fail and you will not pass the grade. I mean, this is not like STAR where you can do projects. This is your actual grade. So what the guidance is we received from the commissioner is our grading must be consistent between face-to-face -face and virtual instruction. Your board policy says if they do not master 70% of the curriculum for that grade level, they are to be retained. That's when we push through summer school to get those kids to progress to the next grade. So your board policy allows for that, and the state is saying you have to be consistent with grading. Yeah. And I think that part of the stuff that she showed us earlier with the uh, registration form, it does basically let the parents know that that crisis learning that happened in the spring is not what you're going to see online in the fall. Um, and so there were some things they had to check. And so even if we did all virtual, we would still need to get something like that out to the parents to have them virtually sign that I understand that I will not pass or whatever. Right. I, I think we have to shift the focus in our minds that we've got to figure out a new way to do education. That's what we're looking at. This this is this is not a, a six week or or two month ordeal. Um, we've seen numbers in in Texas and in Harris County. They doubled 
in about six weeks, and they doubled again in two weeks, and now they've doubled in another week. These are skyrocketing numbers. They're not going to go down overnight. They're not going to just magically disappear in November. Yeah. And and we have to think about this long term. We have to we we can't just patch it up. We we've got to think systemically from the from the foundation. And I think we're doing a great job of that. I think we've got a lot of fears that go with pulling the trigger on that. And those fears are absolutely normal. Change is hard. Change is scary. So uh, I, I just would say I, I concur with you on everything you just said, except that all education cannot be delivered virtually. It's just all educational services that we provide. I, I didn't say that, but okay. Right. No, no, no. I, I didn't say you did. I'm just saying that those are the factors that are most challenging, I guess. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm not trying to diminish those challenges. Uh, what I'm saying is we have to rethink it. During the uh, spring semester, we, we went from two thirds of our students riding a bus to zero. So, but the other thing that, that more perplexing than that, because we factor that into, if we start back up, what percentage is, will be coming back? What percentage will ride the bus? We'll figure that out. But more concerning to us is the, the food service department, nutrition, two thirds of our students um, are provided food, nutritional food services. And in uh, the spring, where we're putting the, the burden on the parent to come to the campus, one third of our students receive that services. So a third of our students who normally receive food services did not. The good news is um, uh, so the, the commissioner, uh, Texas Department of Ag uh, Commissioner, uh, loosened up the burden that used to be you had to be 18 years or younger student, enrolled student, and he loosened it up to include assistance to families because you'd go and you'd have a family of six and only two were students. Now it can be the whole family of six can be taken care of at our, our nutritional services, but it's still the onyx on the grab and go system to get food delivery to our children. So those are the, the, the areas I'm talking about. Academics, are it's challenging to do things, all things virtual, even with uh, any subject. We can say math or art or whatever, but it's challenging to do it all. But do we need to get to a new place where um, our, our students are well ahead of us, uh, technologically speaking, but the delivery of instruction is, is, is just more challenging when you're not face-to-face -face is what the, the counter to that would be. But it's not that we're in a new time, we are. It's been proven globally. Um, the, the challenge for us is, is it, is it indefinitely or is it, are we in hopes for a vaccine and, you know, by Christmas, then maybe return to normal in the spring. That would be a, um, idealistic perspective. <laughs> My wife calls me an idealist all the time, but, uh, I'm hopeful that this would be something of a, a three month or four month or six months nature, uh, the adjustments that we make, but it's going to, whatever we choose, it will drive us more than we will drive it. Tonight's goal was just to have a plan before you so that you could see the uh, effort we put into it. But more than that, uh, to get our community engaged at this point. We've been doing it all internally. Um, the registration process, as Ms. Guy pointed out, is, it's just a chance for them to check this bubble or check that bubble. And it sort of gives us more feedback and more input as to what we can do. So I'm confident, thank you for hearing this presentation from our executive team, but I'm confident by the next board meeting, we will have a whole lot more information for you with your consent to go forward and, and get out the registration piece uh, to find out where we need to be. Uh, I want to hear from everyone. Does other board members want to share your thoughts? Say thank you to Dr. Duarte, Dr. Price, and uh, Matt, and everybody, Rick, and everybody, because I know how hard this was, and you guys are awesome. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. I think it's amazing that Dr. Duarte, I mean, is, is this your last, your, your last meeting with us? And, and you are leaving holding the reins and the trophy of the longest. I was just going to say that. You know, <laughs> Patient possible. <laughs> Take the trophy home. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Uh, for the audience, we hand out a trophy for the longest presentation. So Dr. Dorte, <laughs> even though it was a joint effort, we may give her that joint. trophy. Uh, for the longest presentation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want to thank the board's participation and feedback to us this evening. We certainly do appreciate you. Any other comments 
we wrap it up and move on to our next agenda item. One last comment. Sorry Sir. I missed your farewell. <laughs> Oh. Virtu virtual, virtual hugs on the was... way. Yeah. <laughs> hugs. Don't miss you. We 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 will all miss you. <laughs> okay, so if that concludes your marathon presentation, <laughs> no more questions. She won the trophy. We can go now. <laughs> yeah. Mission accomplished. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right, so we will move on the agenda to. Uh, number six action items where we have consideration of consent agenda. I don't hear you, you. O'Brien. Nope. Not yet. How about now? There yes. you are. Yes, sir. All right. All right, action items this evening is uh, consideration of our consent agenda, item 6A1, 2020-2021 Student Code of Conduct. Number two, agreement between Goose Creek CISD and Hunting Bio Achievement Center, LLC. Number three, moving designated PLC day in November for the 2020-2021 school year. And just a note, that's for election day. So we will not have students on our campuses during election day. Number four, competitive seal proposals, CSPs for evaluation, ranking, and selection of delegate authority to the superintendent or designee to negotiate and to approve the contract and subsequent amendments with COMEX Corporation or subsequently ranked. Number five, cooperative management fees as required by House Bill HB 273. And number six, property tax foreclosure resales. Administration would recommend approval at this time. I've got one question real fast. On that property tax, they had a failed street. Is that in Baytown? Or yes, sir. It's all within, within Goose Creek's boundaries. But that's what I'm saying. Uh, when I looked it up, uh, the fail that's in, uh, in North Harris County, which is still in Goose Creek's district, but I guess this one's in Baytown. Yes, sir. There is a fail street in Baytown. Okay. I move that we approve consent agenda items one through six. Second. I have one question. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, the student code of conduct in my insomnia, I read it. Is the only change <laughs> the dates? Mm -hmm. yes, sir. yes, sir. We did not have a legislative session. Therefore, okay. yes, sir. I just wanted to make sure I didn't overlook something. Thank you. What? <laughs> Okay. You're muted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I thought y'all wanted it that way. <laughs> All right, we have a motion on the floor from Mr. Cotter, and I had a second from. Awesome. So I, was I did. I think it was August. It was, it was Mr. Laredo. Okay, a second from Mr. Laredo to um, accept a consent agenda items A1 through 6. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Say aye. Aye. So all in favor, no against, no abstentions. Motions pass on consent agenda items. All right, so we move forward to agenda B, future board agenda items, board training, and board meetings. For future board agenda items, do we have any special requests or any? Um, I don't know if this will be an agenda item, but uh, what I've been hearing about school names, I like to bring it up as a agenda item or either a board item for closed session, our next meeting. Or this sir. Meeting. Yes, sir. Me. Okay. Huh? Any other future agenda items? How soon can we move forward with the registration process and know how it's going? When is that going to go out? Do we know? 
So it's ready to uh, go live tomorrow. We've got everything in um, set up English and Spanish. We just wanted to be able to share with parents if they opted face to face. We're going to minimize, you know, 15 to 1. We wanted to get, be able to communicate some of those things so that they can make an informed decision. Is it too soon to expect preliminary data next week at next week's meeting just to know how it's going? I Which would think I, we would be able is, to do that. Is, is that complicated to pull out? No, because what this is going to do is set up um, a spreadsheet for each campus. So we'll be able to even see, is there a pattern where one campus, everybody wants to come back and another one, nobody will be able to do it. And, camp. and we don't need an hour and 35 minute presentation, just maybe 35 <laughs> seconds, here's how it's going. Just wanted to get that out there. <laughs> <laughs> or bring everybody cookies or something. <laughs> Virtual cookies. No, I want a real cookie. A real cookie. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, um, board training. I know we were talking about board retreat sometime in the fall. Any other trainings that we have scheduled? I know we have special meeting on the 13th, July the 13th. Right. Do we, do we still have the, uh, diversity training for the board? Yes, sir. We have Dr. Cleveland coming in August. Uh, I don't know if he's nailed down an exact date. He actually, at our last meeting, he booked a date and was coming our way uh, prior to us setting a board meeting up for it. But um, so we did bump it to August because this board meeting was kind of packed. And um, we did, just for your information, we do have two presentations we bumped from this board meeting to the next. One is uh, our strategic plan with Mr. Bollinger, and the other one is a facilities report from Ms. Garcia. So those will be two superintendent reports that I know of, and we'll be ready to prepare any information that we have and can present to you at the next board meeting regarding school names, uh, those p persons that have communicated with us. Okay. Yeah, because I know we had talked about the diversity training also, but we never set a date because he was... Yeah, we were waiting on him to to come back with us with a date. Mm -hmm. yeah, he had scheduled uh, July 17th, a Friday, and then it was requested that we move him to August. So I'm working on a new date with him now. Okay. Okay, so that would be future board member, board trainings and board meetings, next board meeting, July 13th, special meeting at six, and then our regularly scheduled meeting in August. What's the date on that one? Dr. Duarte didn't care. <laughs> Dr. Duarte. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, I think it's August 3rd. August the 3rd is our August board meeting. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so if there's no more questions or comments on item B, we will move to item C, which is closed meeting at this time. The board will now recess into a closed session pursuant to the following sections of the Texas Open Meetings Act. Texas Government Code Section 551.071.072.073.074.075.076.082.083.084 and 087. The time is now 8.33 p.m. No action will be taken while the board is in all right, the time is now 1028 as we reconvene into open session. No, um, what was it? No action was taken while we were in closed session. Let's return to our agenda. <clears throat> and administration would recommend for the board's consideration of personnel. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, to approve the elections and accept the resignations and retirements as presented. Do I have a motion for, uh, are we doing, I'm sorry. Do one, we and start, two. One, one and two. One and two. Approve elections and accept resignations and retirements as presented. I make a motion that we accept and approve. I have a motion by Mr. Cotter and a second by Mr. Poppy. All in favor, are there any questions, conversations? Nope. 
All in favor of said motion, please raise your right hand or say aye. Aye. Seven in favor, that would be zero against and zero abstaining, motion passes. Item number three. Item number three is notification of the teachers that were hired underneath our summer guidelines for superintendent authorization to hire a teacher to provide them a contract in between board meetings. And number four is approved administrative elections. I'd bring to your attention administration's recommendation to hire counselors at elementary and secondary. We have a proposal for hire Donna Johnson as a counselor at Highlands Junior and Stella Greer as a counselor at Baytown Junior. I move to approve. I'll second. I have a motion by Mr. Clem and a second by Ms. Guy. So all in favor of said motion, please raise your right hand or say aye. Aye. That's seven, four, zero against and zero abstaining. Motion passes and 4B, Dr. We have We have a recommendation for a diagnostician, Mirin Zabala. I'll move to approve the election of the diagnostician. Second. I have a motion by Mrs. Guy and a second by Mr. Clem for the diagnostician. Any questions, comments? All in favor, please raise your right hand or say aye. 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 Seven, four, that leaves zero against and zero abstaining. Motion is passed. Administration has no further uh, recommendations at this time. I move to approve. <laughs> I make a motion that we adjourn. Second. <laughs> and it was approved by Mr. Clem. <laughs> All in favor of the motion to adjourn at 1031 p.m., raise your right hand or say aye. Right. <laughs> that would be all in favor with none opposed and none abstaining. So meeting is adjourned, 1031 p.m.